Welcome back. This will be the last lecture on the last chapter of the book. <clears throat> if you're here, which I presume you are since you're listening to this, then uh, congratulations. And let's say this is really a different lecture than many of the others in this book. It is graduate level, probably. Uh, research level, possibly. You know, it's, it's really putting lots of different pieces together, some very interesting mathematics in addition to the computing, but opening the doorway to lots of opportunities. So we'll talk about doing quantum mechanics and doing scattering in momentum space. This is an area in which I've done research for several decades, so I like the area, obviously, uh, and it's an occasion to talk about something that I helped actually write some of the programs for. So maybe the only place in the whole book. So this should be fun. But I can't get anything to work. Here we go. OK, what's our problem? If you haven't already looked at the bound state problem in momentum space, you should stop everything, go back, listen to that lecture, read that material. Because that's easier than this, similar, but we use that as the basis. So we have the same type of problem here. We have a projectile within some medium, multi many particle, multi-particle medium, so that the potential it feels is non-local. Okay? So when you have a multi-particle medium, you get a non-local potential, so the Schrodinger equation becomes equation one here, in which we have the usual kinetic energy term, plus we have here a potential energy term which involves knowing where all of these other particles or the effective potential that they generated happens to be. So you have to integrate over all of space, R prime, to determine what the interaction is at point R. Okay, so it's something more is happening out there than just a local interaction. Here, we're also solving this problem in momentum space. And what that means for scattering is different than bound states. It means that we really have a center of momentum system which we're solving the problem in. So we have a projectile here, say, of momentum k, mass m2, hitting another object, normally called the target, momentum minus k. So they're equal and opposite momentum. That's why it's called the center of momentum frame. And that can have another mass. So the masses can differ, but the momentums are equal and opposite. And since momentum is always conserved, the final state, the state after the scattering, will have one of the particles moving off mo with momentum k prime, the other particle moving off with momentum minus k prime. So the left-hand figure here says we have a non-local potential. The right-hand side of the figure says we're looking at a scattering problem, and this is the geometry for the momenta, for the kinematics, that occur in scattering. Okay? Equation one here, which is the Schrodinger equation in coordinate space, describes such a situation. However, it's an integral differential equation. I said it again, integral differential. And that's hard to solve. One has to solve that iterator, iterator, iteratively, and one has to solve it by both approximating derivatives and integration. And it's usually not very satisfying, and it's usually with more approximations. So uh, we'll go to momentum space and solve the same. Now, last time I said the same words, I said let's go to momentum space and solve the Schrodinger equation. Well now, we won't directly solve the Schrodinger equation mo in momentum space, but we'll in fact solve an integral form of the Schrodinger equation known as the lippmann schwinger equation, named after two very bright guys who figured out how to do all this stuff. Okay? And the issue is we want to solve for scattering. Now, if you don't know any scattering, these terms may not mean too much for you, to you. If you know some scattering, then it should be fine, even classical scattering. When you do a scattering experiment, you measure these particles. You measure particles coming in, projectile, you measure a recoiling particle, and you look at the scattering angle between them, and from that, you deduce what's known as a scattering cross-section. Okay? So it's a scattering cross-section, a differential cross-section, Essentially, it's the uh, effective area of the target as seen by the beam. 
Big cross section means it looks big. A small cross section means it doesn't scatter much. But that's an experimental observable. You actually can measure that in a laboratory. When you solve the Schrodinger equation for a wave function, you're solving for something which is non-observable. Even if you square it, modulus square it to get the probability density, that has nothing directly to do with the scattering experimental configuration. So instead of solving the momentum space wave function using momentum space Schrodinger equation, we look for another equation which deals directly with the scattering cross section. There is no such equation. However, there's an equation that deals with the scattering amplitude, and the scattering amplitude, is modulus squared, is a cross section. So, essentially, we look for, we'll solve for an amplitude, and the experimental observable will be that amplitude squared. Okay, so equation one here is known as the Lippmann-Schwinger equation, and it is equivalent. It's in fact derived directly from the Schrodinger equation. And it gives us an equation for R, which is a form of the scattering amplitude. It's often called the reaction matrix, or rather, or the scattering matrix. Something that gives us the scattering cross section. Okay? And we see here, whoo, it's also an integral equation. Why an integral equation? Because the unknown quantity is now the scattering amplitude, function of two variables, k and k prime, and that unknown quantity also occurs under the integral sign. So we have to integrate over all momenta, a potential, and this unknown quantity, and some energy denominator here. It's the Green's function, if you know what that means. And it has an interesting property, which is we're integrating from 0 to infinity, which is fine, in momentum. But there is a number here, k0. Now, k0 is just the energy. If you want k0 squared over 2 mu is actually the experimental energy. So k0 is a known number. The potential here is known. The energy is known. Because if you've done the experiment, you know what you've done the experiment at. If you don't know that, don't be an experimentalist. And the mass, the reduced mass mu, is also known. So everything, these quantities are all known. k0 is known. And it's a regular number. But at some point, when we do this integration from 0 to infinity, we will hit the value of p equal to k0. You can't avoid it, okay, unless k0 happens to be a complex number, okay, which it's not, but that happens sometimes. Uh, we, we have a singular equation. And so we avoid that singularity by having this capital P out here. So this capital ca calligraphic P means that this is a Cauchy principal value integration. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a moment. So we have this equation to solve. The singularity is handled by using this Cauchy prescription. And we'll solve for, again, angular momentum zero bound states. We're using units, natural units, in which the Planck's constant h-bar is 1. So it's a nice, simple-looking equation. And this is the same equation as we see in the textbook and there's references there for the quantum mechanics textbook as well. So that's your problem. Solve equation one in momentum space, a real integral equation, but a singular integral equation as well. Look at this slide. Pretty, pretty pictures. Well, how do you compute a singular integral? Computers are usually not the way to do this, so we need some analytic skills which we mix in with our computational skills. How do we handle the singularity? Well, here are two figures. On the left is the plot of the function 1 over x. Isn't that nice? Very easy. Perfectly symmetrical. At x equals 0, right at the middle here, this thing is singular. It goes up to infinity. Then it goes to minus infinity as you pass through x. So this is a singularity. You're looking at what's known as a singularity, a place where the function is singular, very, very large. And in this case, it bounces back and forth between plus and minus infinity. OK. If you say, hmm, what's the area under this curve, under the red curve? It wouldn't be hard to say, oh, the area here is negative. And the area on this side, on the right, 
is positive, but it's perfectly symmetric, so the area under this curve should be zero. Interesting. So this curve, although the function is zero, is infinite in the middle, the area under this curve is zero. But that sort of means we can use that fact, but also means we, if we integrated over the singularity, rather than getting infinity as an answer, we get zero. Fine. Here, on the right, is another function, 1 over x minus 10. And you can see, OK, aha, this has a singularity when x is equal to 10 right here, bounces back and forth between plus and minus infinity. Even though it's not obvious by looking at it, the area on the left of the singularity and on the right of the singularities are equal. So both of these functions are singular, and yet they're integrable. Okay, so they have mathematically integrable singularities. We'll make use of that. Okay? So uh, we have what's known now as a singular integral. And we, we call it capital G. And what we mean by a singular integral is an integral whose integrand, small g in this equation, 1, is infinite at some point. Okay? But these will be integrable singularities, which means we'll integrate over the function small g, which has a singularity like we have in the figure here, but the answer will not be infinity, be a finite number. And we can handle that numerically if we're careful. Okay? So it's very dangerous, be warned. Num any numerical work when you actually can evaluate a function which is equal to infinity, can give you garbage or nonsense on the computer unless you know what's going on, unless you're careful. So that's a nice challenge, but we're up to it. We can do it. Let's look at the next slide. Okay. So the next slide answers the question three different ways. How do you compute singular integrals? Okay. The answer is, of course, well, you have to make a decision what to do with the singularity. One approach is to give the energy, or give this constant k0 in the equations, a small imaginary part. So we can give it a small, real, a small positive or a small negative imaginary part. And the first two parts of this figure do just that. In one part, if we, if we give the uh, if we give the energy a small imaginary part, we move it up in the plane here. So essentially, when we do the integration, we go below it, and then we move it down on the left-hand side, and so we go around it that way. Or we can give it a small positive imaginary part, a small negative imaginary part. So we move the singularity down here and up on that side, so we move it we integrate not through it, but around it, and we miss it in that way. Okay? So A and B here, the first two parts, give the singularity a small positive or negative imaginary part. The other approach, or another approach, and there could be various uh, variations of this, is to use is the Cauchy principal value prescription, P, as it's called. And that says, well, if the singularity is right here in the middle, we integrate up to this is a singularity at k, or k0 in our case, you integrate 2k minus epsilon, where epsilon is an infinitely small number, and then we integrate from k plus epsilon, that should be epsilon, where epsilon is again this infinitesimal small number, and then we evaluate that, we never touch this point, and we take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, so this essentially pinches or squeezes gets infinitesimally close to the singularity with never going through it. That's what this capital P represents. So mathematically, or in terms of just equations, capital P says if you have a function that has a singularity, in our case at k0 here, Cauchy principal part, as it's also called, says take the limit as epsilon goes to zero of an integration to the, that goes to the left of the singularity plus a separate integration that starts to the right and goes out to infinity. Never go through it, but get as close as you want. Fine. So now, let's use that newfound mathematical knowledge and realize, look at these two friends of ours. Okay, so look at this next slide, please. On the next slide, we talk about 
how we evaluate numerically a principal value integration. These are known in mathematics as Hilbert transforms, like Fourier transforms, but they, they're a principal part of evaluation. So we have these two functions we've seen before, and they both have the property that the area under them is zero. And if you say, well, what do we do with the singularity? If you evaluate the singularity with a Cauchy principal part in prescription, they have zero integration. Okay. So the first, let me go up. The first code here says that if we take the principal part integration of 1 over k minus k0, so that's where we've just moved the singularity over to the right, if you evaluate that, that answer is zero. Fine. If you now break this first integral up into a part from zero to infinity and another part from minus infinity to zero, change the variable on one, so add them together, you get another form exactly mathematically equivalent to the first integration going from zero to plus infinity, but then you get a k squared minus k zero squared. That also has zero integration. That's the, those are the tools we need. In particular, if you remember the Lippmann Schringer equation involved the integration from zero to infinity. So we can make use of the second form, from, which just goes from zero to infinity, of a principal value integral, which is zero. So if we have a function to evaluate, principal part integration, of any function f of k arbitrary, and it has the same denominator, or some denominator that can be put into a form, such as k squared minus k0 squared, we can just say, aha, let's just add in an integral of zero value. So here on equation one, on the right-hand side here, we have an integral of zero. So all we've done here is we've added in, or in this case subtracted, zero, from the integration we had, and we're left with f of k as before, minus k, f of k0, which is just a number, because k0 is not being integrated over, over the same denominator. But actually, equation 2, if you look at it, has something peculiar about it. Notice that on the right-hand side, there's no longer this p. It's gone here. We no longer have to say this is a, a Cauchy principal value. and even though it looks like something weird happens when k equal to k0, since we subtracted in the numerator a function at k equals k0, when the numerator 0 is exactly the same place where the denominator is 0, and the integrand is no longer singular. So on the left, we had a Cauchy principal value prescription, which had to be handled in a very precise way. You couldn't do that on the computer, per se. On the right, we've rewritten it in a form which we can do on the computer. And as, as we get arbitrarily close to the singularity k0, we just you can expand the numerator and Taylor series and see that, oh, first term cancels. We just get a derivative up here. It's a finite integrand now, as well as a finite integral. Aha, we can now do Cauchy principal parts on the computer. And there's other ways as well, but this is a straightforward, direct way. Some of the other ways involve having the integration symmetric and then literally closing in on it. But we won't talk about that. This is more than enough. So let's get on and apply this and then be clever and see what to do. <coughs> so as we've done for the bound state problem, we want to convert our integral equation into a matrix equation. And we do that in several steps. First, we convert the integral equation into simultaneous algebraic equations. We evaluate those on a grid, integration point grid. And then we have just simultaneous linear equations. And then we try to put that in a matrix form. That's all we have to do here. We have to be a little more clever than that here. So let's see. So what do we have? So first, we have to rewrite that principal value description in terms of a definite integral. So if you go, go back to the, what we call the lippmann schwinger equation, remember, it, it looked just like this, but with a p out in front, and it didn't have these terms as well. It didn't have that term. Okay? So now, though, however, we'll remove the p, but we add in this extra subtraction term. It's called the subtraction. Very clever name. 
And now we have equation one, an integral equation. It's no longer a singular integral equation because even though the denominator vanishes at some point, the numerator vanishes more rapidly on top. And we can evaluate equation one on the computer. Very good. Okay. So we convert this first to simultaneous algebraic equations by approximating the integration over p by Gauss points. Okay, so we sum instead over n Gauss points, as we have in equation 2 here, and that's the approximation. And then we have th the first term in the integration, which we sum over, here's p, so we have, or over there's another p and another p, so we have two places here which we have to sum over, and there's one, and there's the other. Okay. If we look at the second term, we're summing over p. There's no p up here. Oh, none of these terms in the subtraction have any p. So they get moved outside of the summation down below here in equation 2, you see. And the summation is then just over the weights, the integration weights, and the denominator. And you might say, oh, that's an integral which is equal to 0. Well, analytically, it's equal to 0. But here, we need to keep this term in to cancel off any of the singularities that occur from the first term. So these are the two terms. What we have is now ooh, a, uh, an equation. It's a little more complicated looking at the bound state equation. But it's an equation with n plus 1 unknowns, n being the n grid points, the n Gaussian quadrature points, and the n plus 1 being we also have to know the value of this R matrix, this unknown quantity, for R equal to K0, K0. Whereas, if you look here, on the left-hand side, we don't know what K is, so that's unknown. K0 here stays constant throughout. So that's a K0 there, there's a K0 there. That doesn't change. So we have a vector, an n plus one dimensional vector of unknown values of R as given here. K0 is always fixed. You know what that momentum value is. K sub j are just the grid points. So that's the problem we have to solve. Equation 2 here is a set of algebraic equations. But we'll, we'll make that simple as we did last time by evaluating it for k values, the continuous variable, on a grid. So look at the next slide, please. OK, so now we have to evaluate our equation on a grid, but we also have to add another point into the nomenclature, into the summation, because we have this experimental point k0. So we define k sub j, or k sub i here, to be the usual Gaussian quadrature points for the first n points. But if the index is 0, we use the 0 index to represent the experimental point, the point where the experimentalist has done the measurement. His energy is just k0 squared over 2 mu, or her energy, whatever. If we do that, we then get equation 2 here, with i represents the, the, the k value. Second index, we're forgetting about because it it's always k0. We get a simultaneous set of n plus 1 linear equations to solve. And these are them. Okay, So we have the unknown here are the r values, the r values, the r0 value there. Okay? So we have n plus 1 unknowns. We have that many equations as well. So we should be able to solve this. But the first step we have to go through now is to write this as a matrix equation. And it doesn't quite look like a matrix equation yet because there's a lack of symmetry here. So. One of the things, the clever things people have done, and I think this was done by Hoftel and Tabakin originally, is to say, in order to write this as a matrix equation, let's define another constant. So let's define another vector called a d, and it has values which are equal to one sum here uh, for, for the Gaussian quadrature points, and is equal to this other sum, the other term here, which is the whole summation for the on shell or the k0, the uh, observable experimental point. Okay? If we do that, then equation 2 becomes equation 3. And equa 
Qu I'm sorry, equation two becomes equation four here in red. Okay, so we get a matrix equation. R is equal to V plus D V R. Fine. How do we solve that? Well, if we bring over the D V R term to the left hand side, we can factor out the R. Fine, and then we get uh, R times one minus D V. Multiply by the inverse. Fine. We get equation four here. That's the solution. Okay. So left hand side is a matrix equation. The de solving it by determining the inverse, which is one approach, gives us a direct solution. Will the inverse exist? You may be thinking, didn't he just tell me in the other lecture that this inverse can't exist in order for there to be an eigenvalue problem? The answer is that's true. But this is not the eigenvalue problem. The eigenvalue problem is for bound states. And this doesn't work for bound states, okay? But for scattering, any energy is a solution to the Schrödinger equation. It's a continuous spectrum for bound states. The point is to get the scattering amplitudes, not the energy, because any energy is a solution. So the inverse always exists. So that's it. You have, you're home free now. You have a matrix library to use. You can go solve this problem. So go solve it. I'll give you some hints, but you can just quit now if you want. Okay, so here we have our solution. Here we have our problem. R is V plus V dV dVR. We want to solve that. The direct solution is by inverse matrix inversion. We give you a Python code here <clears throat> which solves the problem directly. It's not necessarily the fastest way, but it's a good way. Uh, the fastest way may be Gaussian quadrature. Now, both Gua Gaussian, I'm sorry, Gaussian elimination, both Gaussian elimination and matrix inversion are in various mathematical libraries for matrix routines. So you could use either. Gaussian elimination is, tends to be the fastest, maybe more reliable. We've used direct matrix inversion because it turns out this other object here, this inverse, is related to the wave function, scattering wave function. And sometimes we want to use that wave function so that it gives us a way of determining the wave function directly. So <clears throat> here is the, the code. This is the one that runs. And it, what it's writing, solving for right now is sine squared of the phase shift. So this is, in fact, proportional to this cross-section that the experimental list would measure for L equals zero. And what you're seeing is that sine squared delta has gone through one. It's going through a maximum. These are the resonances. So these are the resonance scattering you can get when you scatter from this delta shell potential. So remember that we have this uh, you know, delta shell here. Was scattering from, and you can set up standing wave like patterns inside. Some waves get trapped, they correspond to this point here at the maximum. Okay? And this point as well. So here you can see, and you may think this is a numerical artifact, and believe me, we did for quite a while, that there's some very unusual property that goes on, a cusp like behavior. Well, it's a very, very sharp resonance, is what it is. Uh, very, very hard to compute accurately at exactly this. This is the value of KB down here. And this is K0, which is the energy, and B, which is the size of this sphere. Okay. So this is what the solution should look like. Okay. And then if we, if you look at the code, we could see how we've solved for it. So there's lots of different parts of this code. We don't need all of it. But you can see what we're doing here is we're calculating this matrix F, which we call D up before here, but actually the code has some other terms to it. So there's the, the matrix F being computed. There's the one being uh, put, added into it. And here we're just saying, OK, take the matrix F and find the inverse of it from the linear algebra library and then multiply that inverse by the potential and that gives us the R matrix. So this, these two lines do all the hard solutions. Finds the inverse right there, here it multiplies it, 
as a matrix. So it's pretty straightforward. So uh, that's all you have to do. And now we have an analytic check. Okay, so we, we're doing the delta shell potential, so you may as well go ahead, get to work. You've seen that this is what the cross-section should look like. And if you look at the analytic answer here, you see that it's, ex it's very close to the numerics, at least uh, through the first resonance. But after this incredibly sharp peak, the numerics tend to fall off, or at least the numerics as we've calculated them. And as I've said, the delta shell potential is numerically just barely integrable. So it's hard to do numerically, and, it, and, and it's not, in, not exactly reproducing the analytic result any longer, but it's still pretty close. So you could probably do better. We haven't bothered. We'd like to show you we're not always so perfect. So solve the delta shell potential. In momentum space, we know the potential. It just falls off like k prime and k, 1 over k prime k. So that's only a logarithmic-like conversion. It's not good enough. But you can check the answers with the analytic solution is given here. So the analytic solution is just tangent delta. It's given by this expression. So let's determine the phase shift. And the R matrix you get from the code, one particular value of it, as given on equation 3, is also proportional to tangent of delta. So you can determine direct comparison of experiment theory, which is what we have here. So again, repeat the calculation. Try for different values of potential strength. Most importantly, vary the number of grid points. You know too small a number can't be precise. As you make it larger and larger, you should increase the precision up to the point where round-off error starts coming in and causes problems. So it's time for you now to do the computation. Let me wish you farewell. Happy computing. And we hope you've enjoyed the lectures. And let me thank Sally behind the camera again, Hare, who's been working with us. and. Hope you read the book many times and enjoy it. Bye bye. Woo We're done. Thank you, Dr. Lennon. Oh, no, no, hey, stop it, stop it. Woo Turn this off, turn this off. <laughs>